Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Would you turn to me your bulletins? We have a number of announcements to make today. We actually have a very, very full and busy day ahead of us today. Uh, first of all, you'll find in your bulletin, we have an insert. Uh, we're having, you were blessed last week if you were here by a special ministry from our brother Daniel Soul from Brazil. And uh, so we've arranged to have a special service uh, for this coming Saturday, March 17th at 7 p.m. A uh, special concert of praise and worship. Uh, he's going to be involved. Uh, Sister Allie and Brother Karras are going to be involved. Uh, we've got some other brothers and sisters involved. And this is just going to be a special service. It's open for everyone. So feel free to invite family and friends and anyone that you can think of uh, to come and join us for this special service of uh, praise and worship this coming Saturday, March 7th. Also, too, next Sunday, March 18th, at 4 p.m., the church will be holding its annual business meeting. Uh, refreshments will be provided, and all partners of the church are encouraged to attend and participate in the meeting. And also, even if you are not an official partner of Vineyard Assembly of God, but you still consider this church to be your church, Feel free to come anyway. You can sit in and listen to all the uh, all the reports and just see how business is conducted here in the church and see how God is blessing the Vineyard Assembly of God. Also, to today, I'm sure you noticed as you walked in, a table out in the foyer full of baked goods. Uh, that's our team ministry, Safe to Shore team ministry date sale. And uh, again, feel free to purchase some items as you go today. And again, 10% of whatever the team ministry raises will be donated to the building fund for the expansion project. Also, let me give you this testimony too. Uh, we have the testimonies I shared about God's provision for the building fund last week. Over this past week, I had another individual contact me. Uh, they're getting ready to move off island, and uh, they donated some furniture to the church to sell uh, for the building fund. One of the pieces is a solid charity hutch that they paid six thousand dollars for. Wow. Yeah, so we got some things to wow. sell. We got some blessings there coming in, and uh, I know that God's going to do some more big blessings. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. And for the ladies, on Saturday, March 24th, you're invited to attend the Brave Conference in New Bedford, Massachusetts. It's not too late to register online and to sign up on the sign-up sheet in the foyer. Uh, the sign-up sheet in the foyer is really so that we can get a head count because we are taking, or the ladies are taking the church van off island. Uh, so we got to make sure that we've got enough seats in that van for everyone. Also, too, coming up, Water Baptism Sunday on April the 15th. Uh, that will be during the Sunday morning worship service. We'll have the baptismal tank set up. I promise that this year I will not flood the sanctuary. And uh, so please, again, that sign-up sheet is out in the foyer. So if you're interested in water baptism by immersion, if you've never been water baptized by immersion, just sign up on that sheet out there. And also, too, we have that box downstairs for the food bank here on the island. Uh, someone said to me last Sunday, hunger knows no season. And that is so true that there are always families and individuals in need or in transition. Uh, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. My wife and I, we went through a time in between our previous church and this church I, I was working a job, but it was an entry-level position. I was only making $10 an hour, and uh, a church's food bank helped get us through month to month. And so that's why I feel strongly about supporting the bigger food pantry. 
So with that, that's enough announcements for now. A little bit later in the service, Sister Gloria is here from North Point Bible College. And uh, she's going to be sharing uh, some uh, amazing things happening in her life and an amazing opportunity that she has. Uh, we want to welcome back uh, Brother Junior and Sister Elizabeth Martins from Vacation. Nice to have you back. And uh, in case anyone has tried to contact me over this past week by my cell phone, by text or call, it's not because I don't like you or I'm being impolite. My cell phone is dead. And so i got to get a new one. So that's why it hasn't worked. So I'll probably be getting you a new number. I spent two hours on the phone with the company this week trying to get it fixed. And they finally said it's dead. So. That was it. Uh, we need to keep a few people in prayer. Uh, our brother Frank Baird, continue to keep him in prayer as he goes through his health struggles. Uh, keep Briella Barrows in prayer. Uh, she and her mom aren't with us today. Uh, she's got a fever. Uh, Briella does, not her mom. Uh, but Briella's got a fever. And uh, Sister Joan Fennell uh, went to the emergency room last night. Uh, I was able to go see her. Uh, she's a diabetic, as many of you know, uh, but she got a bad infection in one of her toes, uh, which of course is more complicated for somebody with diabetes. So when, when I saw her, they were giving her antibiotics, and uh, so they kept her overnight. So please keep her in your prayers as well. So with that, let's all stand together and let's turn in our Bibles and take a look at the Word of God today. You turn with me to Romans chapter 9. And we're going to pick up at verse 19. Romans chapter 9, verse 19, where we left off a couple of weeks ago. The Bible says, Well then, you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what he makes them to do? No, don't say that. Who are you, a mere human being, to argue with God? Should the thing that was created say to the one who created it, Why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have the right to use the same lump of clay to make one jar for decoration and another to throw garbage into? In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power. He is very patient with those on whom his anger falls who are destined for destruction. He does this to make the riches of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy, who were prepared in advance for glory. And we are among those whom he selected, both from the Jews and from the Gentiles. Concerning the Gentiles, God says in the prophecy of Hosea, those who were not my people, I will now call my people, and I will love those whom I did not love before. And then at the place where they were told, you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. Glory to Jesus. I thank God for that because by my family heritage, I am a Gentile as are most of us in this room. And we can thank God that he's decided to show us mercy and call us his children. Yeah. The Bible goes on to say, concerning Israel, Isaiah the prophet cried out, though the people of Israel are as numerous as the sand of the seashore, only a remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth quickly and with finality. And Isaiah said the same thing in another place. If the Lord of heaven's armies had not spared a few of our children, we would have been wiped out like Sodom, destroyed like Gomorrah. What does all this mean? Even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God, and it was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel, who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law, never succeeded. 
because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by trusting in him. They stumbled over the great rock in their path. God warned them of this in the scriptures when he said, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. But anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Amen. Praise the Lord. So anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, will never be disgraced. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's praise and worship the Lord this morning. Let's go to him in prayer. Father in heaven, we worship you today and we praise your name, Lord. We honor and thank you, O God. We praise you for your great goodness to us. And Lord, we have some needs that we want to take to you this morning. Lord, we want to lift up to you our brother Frank Bayer as he continues to deal with his health problems and health struggles and he's unable to get out much, Lord. Father, we just pray that your mercy would be new to him, that, Lord, out of all the messages that he heard preached to him over the years, out of all the scriptures that he read, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would bring those things back to his mind so that he could remember them and continue to benefit from the food that he received spiritually in the past. Father, we pray for your continued touch in his body and strength and healing for him. Lord, we pray for Briella Bowers. Lord, we pray for this little girl. Lord, we pray for your healing upon her that the fever that she's had will be taken away completely and will not turn into anything worse in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up to you our sister, Joan Fennell. Lord, we pray for her, O oh God, that, Lord, you would bless her, that you would strengthen her, that you would encourage her, and above all, Lord, that you would touch her toe and heal that wound, heal that infection, O oh God. Lord, I pray that those tissues would just come right back together and be restored like new. Lord, even though she's got diabetes and she said she scratched her toe once and it took months for it to heal. Lord, we pray that it will not be so this time, but that, Lord, you would heal her and heal her fast in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, too, O oh God, for the many blessings that you've been giving to this church in response to prayer, in response to faith in you. Lord, you are pouring out provision and blessing on the building fund project, O oh God. Lord in heaven, we thank you, O oh Lord, for people stepping forward, for you bringing blessing into people's lives, and that, Lord, they're being moved by your spirit to turn around and bless your work. Lord, we thank you and we praise you this morning, and we ask your anointing to be upon this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord, church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Amen. 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 Amen.
praise the Lord for this beautiful service today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for this visitation of the Holy Spirit here. We know that you're always here. But we also know that the Holy Spirit sometimes chooses to move in an extraordinary way. Lord, we thank you, O oh God, that you've given us the ability to respond to the Holy Spirit and to receive the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.
glad I don't stand there looking like that. You can come forward as well. And let's pray over the offering. Father in heaven, <clears throat> Lord, we thank you, O God, that it says in your word that we are to thank you because you give us the power to get wealth which means it's the power to be able to go out and have a job. Lord, you've given us our minds, our intellects, you've given us our bodies, you've given us each sets of talents and gifts and abilities, Lord, so that we can use them not only for your glory, but also, Lord, to earn a living for ourselves and for our families. So, Lord, it's a privilege for us to honor and worship you by giving back just 10% of what you give to us through our incomes. And so, Lord, we ask that you bless these tithes and these offerings. Lord, may you use them for the benefit of your kingdom and your ministry here in Vineyard Assembly of God and across this island of Martha's Vineyard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Graça e paz para todos. Essa canção que nós iremos adorar a Deus. Diz, I surrender all. Tudo entregarei. Nesta manhã, faça o seu melhor. Entrega tudo a Ele. Quando você entregar tudo a Ele, e confiar de todo o teu coração, já deu certo, porque você entregou tudo, não se preocupe, ele sabe o que você precisa, e nesta manhã, confia tão somente, que ele é fiel, para cumprir na sua vida, o que você precisa, e muito mais, tudo entregarei,
Cristo a ti entrego Corpo, alma e coração Este mundo mal Renego Oh, Jesus Aceita a mim I surrender all. I surrender all. Oh, to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender Louvor Entrego a ti Meu coração aberto está Receba, ó oh Pai Minha adoração No teu santo No teu santo No teu santo Crê no teu milagre? Pray your blessing upon each and every one of them. 
We pray your ministry to be with them and their teachers and with their parents. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. What an incredible service today. My goodness. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> We're continuing today the series I've been preaching entitled Lent, An Invitation to Repent. And so far in this series, we've talked about some of what I sense the Holy Spirit leading me toward as major issues and sins within our culture, both as a nation and globally, and as a church, that we need to take a look at and allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts that perhaps these are areas that we need to look at and we need to repent of. We talked the first week about violence in our culture and around the world and how because we've opened the doors of sin in our cultures that violence is the inevitable result and we need to pray and repent of these things. And then we talked about racism how that is an issue not just in the United States, but it is an issue that affects every culture around the world and that we need to repent of that. Last week we preached on idolatries and addictions, how that every addiction is actually rooted into a self-idolatry where there's an area of our lives where Jesus is not allowed to be Lord. And we need to repent of that. Today I'm going to preach about something different now. Today the title of the message is A High Tolerance for Pain. I'm going to be talking about false teachings in the church. Let's look at Revelation chapter 2 verses 12 through 17. This is one of the seven letters that Jesus dictated to the Apostle John and told the Apostle John to write these seven letters down and send them specifically to these seven churches. To Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17, the Bible says, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, right, to the city, to the church that was in the ancient city of Pergamum. And remember, this is Jesus speaking. He says, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin, so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, as we break the bread of your word, this spiritual food that you've given to us, Lord, as we break this bread and as we share it among ourselves, Lord, I pray, Father, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be present here, to enable me to preach and to teach in the manner in which you want this message communicated today. And Lord, let your anointing be upon your precious people and all who listen online, that they may also, Lord, hear and receive what your spirit is speaking to your church today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Some people have a high tolerance for pain. 
Some people are described as having a very high tolerance for pain. And sometimes that's a good thing to have a higher tolerance for pain because a higher tolerance for pain enables you to push through fatigue to a new level of strength and endurance. But sometimes a high tolerance for pain isn't a good thing. Because pain is a symptom of a problem. If you're having pain somewhere in your body, it means that something isn't quite right within your body. And a high pain tolerance can cause you to ignore the problem and thereby create larger problems. I talked to my father this week and I got his permission to share this story about my dad. It was Christmas Day, 1984. It was in the afternoon. Of course, 1984, I was 10 years old at the time, and my younger brothers and sisters, we had my parents awake probably around 3 o'clock in the morning to open up presents. And so by afternoon, my father, he's sitting in his chair, and he is asleep. And the phone rang, and I answered the phone, and this is back in the days when it was a dial phone stuck to your wall with a long cord that always got knotted up. You remember those? And it was my grandfather, my father's father, and, and I said, Dad, it's for you. And my father was sitting in his chair and he woke up with a snort and he jumped up. And the moment he stood up, I heard a pop and he just kept going and fell right down onto the floor. And then he, I'm just staring at him and he looks at me and he says, give me the phone. So <laughs> handed him the phone, you know, unwound 60 feet of cord it seemed like, and he talked to his father for a while and then gave me the phone and I hung it back up for him and he got up and he walked around, he brought in firewood, he did all sorts of things all afternoon and then finally by evening he calls my uncle who lived nearby and says, you got to take me to the hospital. And I remember my dad going out the door and he had this uh, walking stick and he's using it to walk. What had happened was his foot was asleep when he stood up the muscle wasn't there to take his weight, and the bone on the side of his foot snapped. And that was the pop. But because of the high tolerance for pain, my father walked around on it all day, brought in firewood, and so those pieces of bone were grinding like this. Everybody's getting a little squeamish now. And my dad wound up in a cast for weeks healing from that broken bone. And you think, oh, you know, that was my dad, you know. But I've got to tell you, and my wife is smiling at me because she knows that the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. In 2012, I broke my left big toe in part of my foot wrestling with my two boys. We were fooling around on our bed and I came off the bed and one of the boys was on the floor and I didn't want to land on him so I put my foot down quick and my big toe curled underneath my left foot and all my weight went on that. And I heard a pop and my foot swelled up and turned all these shades of black and blue and green and yellow and did I bother to go to the doctor? No. I just kept going. And I thought, well, it's healed up okay after a while. Well, two years later, I had to go to a podiatrist because my left foot was killing me, just hurting. And so even today, I wear orthotic inserts in my shoes to help even me out. And then because of that, now I've got another problem, and that's sometimes when I'm on my feet a lot, my left hip starts to hurt. It's all on the left side. Sometimes a high pain tolerance is not a good thing. And the Bible compares the church in 1 Corinthians 12 to the human body. It says that we're all members of the same body. We're all parts of the same body, the body of Christ. And so one of the areas that the body of Christ experiences pain is when false teachings are present within the body. And unfortunately for the Christian church all around the world, and Christianity is growing like never before all around the world, the Christian church is showing a very high tolerance for the pain of false teachings like never before. 
So much of the bad theology that has come out of the American church is now being picked up and carried into the African church and into the churches of South America in the Brazilian church and in other churches there. Heavy with the prosperity doctrine, the idea that the extreme teaching that if you're right with God, nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. Well, I want to tell you something about that. That was the same theology that Job's three friends showed up and talked to Job about, and God wound up rebuking them for that theology, for that thinking, that false teaching. Yet it's alive and well today. So I want to share with you three words of Jesus from this passage of Scripture that we read about this idea of a high tolerance for pain specifically in the area of false teachings. Verses 12 and 13 of Revelation 2 say, To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live. Jesus is saying to every church everywhere, I know where you live. I know where you live. Now, I want you to realize this isn't a threat. This isn't, I know where you live. <laughs> it's not a threat. This is a comfort. Jesus is saying to every church everywhere, I know where you live. I know where you're at. I know your circumstances. I know your situation. I know your environment. I know your challenges. I know your history. I know your hopes. I know your fears. I know your faith. I know everything that it is to live in a church on Martha's Vineyard. Jesus knows all about that. Jesus says, I know everything about you. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2, But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine, Jesus is saying to you today. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. That's what Jesus is saying when he says, I know where you live. In affirmation of those promises that we just read in Isaiah 43, the Holy Spirit has made certain that a Christian church had been planted in the city of Pergamum, a city that was so given over to not just pagan idolatry, but they were deep into the occult deep into Satanism, deep into sorcery, deep into the demonic worship. So much so that Jesus declares in, this ver in these verses that this, at that time in history, the city of Pergamum was where Satan had his capital on earth. But yet, Jesus made sure that there was a church planted in that city. Isn't that incredible? Absolutely incredible. And that means two things. Number one, it means that every true Christian church anywhere is planted by faith in defiance of Satan and his kingdom of lies and fear and darkness. Every church everywhere that is calling on the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is planted by God in defiance of Satan and his kingdom of lies and darkness. Every church, as an individual local church body, we are here as an act of God's mercy. Amen. We are also here as an act of God's mission. We're here as an act of God's mission for this island. Now, what does this mean? This means that every true Christian church anywhere can expect outside cultural pressure and some degree of persecution. It will happen. Jesus said it was going to happen. 
me give you a couple quick examples from the United States, from our country here. In 2011, a 16-year-old student named Kenneth Dominguez was disciplined for telling fellow students about his faith in Jesus and bringing a Bible to school. And that happened in Southern California. As the case developed, it turned out he wasn't disrupting classes. He was sharing with his fellow students during his lunchtime, yet he was disciplined for it. Think, oh, that's Southern California, Pastor. Well, in 2009, an eight-year-old here in Taunton, Massachusetts, was suspended from school and required to undergo a psychological exam at his parents' expense because he drew a picture of Jesus on the cross. And the school said it was a violent image. There will be outside cultural pressures. There will be persecutions happening. And Jesus understood that this was happening to the church in Pergamum. They were a church that was planted in Satan's capital city, of course they were going to get outside pressures and persecutions. In fact, Jesus even says one of the members of the church, Antipas, had been already martyred for his faith in Jesus. He had been killed. History tells us, it's not in the Bible, but it's in church history that that Antipas, he was killed by being put inside of this large statue of a bull that was hollow and they built a fire underneath the statue and they cooked them alive in the statue because that was how they would sacrifice people because as they screamed inside this big large metal statue it would resonate and sound like the bull bellowing so they thought of it as like the statue of their god was coming to life in that way The Apostle Paul told us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It will happen. The church of Pergamum should have expected the pressure and persecution, and they could have responded in power and grace because their very existence there in Pergamum was a miracle, but they didn't. Something happened in the church in Pergamum where they went a little bit wrong. And like an airplane, if an airplane is on a course and it goes just half a degree off, eventually over time it's going to be miles and miles off course. The church of Pergamum the outside pressure and the persecution caused them to draw together, and that's a good thing. However, when they drew together, they chose to overlook, to ignore, to tolerate the presence of false teaching within the church. In other words, they chose to tolerate the pain of false teachings in order to mitigate the pain of persecution. So Jesus says to the church of Pergamum and to every church, I know where you live. I know what's going on. I know the dynamics that are happening that maybe you're not even consciously aware of. Jesus understands these things and he sees what is happening within our hearts and within our lives and within our minds. So it's a word of great comfort. But that's not all that Jesus said. It goes on in verse 14 and 15 of Revelation 2. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Jesus is saying to every church everywhere, I have a few things against you. I have a few things against you. I want you to realize that that isn't a message of condemnation. 
Condemnation is designed to bring guilt and fear. This isn't a message of condemnation at all. It's being spoken by Jesus. This is a message of conviction that is designed to bring deeper correction and greater faith. Jesus is saying there's a little area that needs to be adjusted. This is like your medical doctor saying, I found something a little off and we have to work on. It's to bring correction. It's to bring greater health. See, false teachings are not different opinions or personal convictions or just immature confusions. You see, as we grow up in Christ, sometimes we just have an immature confusion about something. You know, like with me when I was real little, I thought my parents made the weather. Yeah, I've told you that story before. You know, because I'd hear my parents say, you know, it's going to rain tomorrow. I'd wake up in the morning and it was raining. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, I, eventually I realized that they watched the news at 6 o'clock and heard that it was going to rain tomorrow. That was an immature confusion. And sometimes we have that as Christians. But we grow out of those. False teachings are not different opinions or personal convictions or immature confusions. False teachings are corruptions of and divergences from the core teachings of Christianity. You can have a personal conviction. Like, you may have a personal conviction that you feel like God doesn't want you to eat meat, to be a vegetarian. If that's between you and God, okay. But the moment you begin to teach that to other people, say, look, if you really want the Holy Spirit, you gotta do what God told me to do, which is not eat meat, then it becomes a false teaching, okay? Because it begins to corrupt and diverge from the core truths of Christianity. Tim Chalice, and I don't agree with everything that he says. He's a little extreme in some of his views. But he does give a great list here of seven kinds of false teachers in the church. And I'm going to give that list to you right now. The first is the heretic. And that's one who teaches direct contradictions to the central doctrines of Christianity. The heretic. One who tells you Jesus really didn't die on the cross. The one who tells you that God is a woman, you know, the one who tells you that, that, that you really don't need to be saved from your sins because there's no such thing as sin. Those are heresies. Those are taught by heretics. They're direct contradictions to God's word. Then there's number two, the charlatan, and that's one who uses Christianity as a means of self-enrichment. Remember years ago, I saw a preacher on TV, and he invited everyone to write down the amount of your debts on a piece of paper and send it into his ministry with a gift of $1,000, and that he was going to gather all your pieces of paper and burn your debts on this brazen altar that he had made, and God was going to deliver you from your debt. Well, wait, I thought right away, well, wait a minute, you send your written debt in with a $1,000 check. You know, the only person whose debts are going to be delivered is his. That's a charlatan. Then there's the false prophet, one who claims to speak new truth that is outside of Scripture. Somebody who says, oh, God just gave me this incredible vision, this dream, this revelation. And they start teaching you and telling you things that are not in the Bible. And they always justify it when you challenge them and say, well, that's not in the Bible. Well, because the Spirit is doing a new thing. Beware of that, church. Because God is not going to contradict his own word. Otherwise, it makes God a liar. Then there's the abuser, one who uses and abuses others solely for his own benefit. And this happens in churches. Then there's the divider, one who uses false teaching to disrupt and divide a church. Then there's the tickler, one who preaches and teaches only what people want to hear and disregards what they need to hear. 
And then there's the speculator, number seven, the last one on the list. The speculator is one obsessed with novelty. The speculator takes the bulk of the Bible and ignores it to obsess about matters that are trivial or novel. I was talking with one of my friends from my Bible college days. His wife works as a church secretary in Rhode Island, and he told me a story of what happened to her one day. She said this guy walked into the church office, walked up to her in the office and says, does your pastor preach the truth? She's like, well, yeah. And he says, well, is he telling you about Antarctica and the hidden bases of the Nephilim giants? She says, no. And then he says, well, the pastor's not preaching you the truth. And he turned around and walked out. Not only is that out of an episode of the Twilight Zone or something from Star Trek, I don't know. But that's a speculator, somebody who got obsessed with some kind of novelty and that's all they see now. Remember what was happening in Pergamum. Because of the hostile environment in which they lived, the church of Pergamum, they drew together, but they were tolerating the presence of false teachings and false teachers within the church. Listen to what Jesus had to say about this. Matthew chapter 16, verses 5 through 12. It says, When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The disciples discussed it among themselves and says, it's because we didn't bring bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you have little faith. Why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it that you don't understand that I'm not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. See, Jesus compared false teaching to yeast. A little bit mixed in with your flour and your water and your oil and your salt eventually spreads and influences an entire batch of dough. Tolerating the pain of false teaching will eventually cause greater sickness and greater pain in the whole church. And there are many false teachings running through the church today. I mentioned the prosperity doctrine already. Then there's the pursuit of spiritual manifestations that are not in the Bible I mean, God gave us nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, but there are people who are wanting to invent more. There's also the rejection of the Bible as the inspired and authoritative word of God. All of those. See, there are also false teachings, too, that on the surface sound and look biblical. And they'll tell you something, and then they'll quote a scripture. My mother, I was talking to her just this past week, and she shared with me about how somebody she knew was talking about how they had heard a teaching that said that when Jesus died on the cross, he went down into hell, and demons were beating him up in hell, and he had to be born again in hell to be raised from the dead. You know what? That's not in my Bible. I don't know, maybe I missed that somewhere. That's somebody's funny imagination, their idea that now they're putting out as a novel teaching. And what do they do? They take a few scriptures out of context and they quote them out there and people sit down, oh yes, that's gotta be true because he quoted Exodus 25, 12 or he quoted Romans eleven fourteen, and he did all, he quoted these verses. 
See, some false teachings look biblical and sound biblical on the surface, but when you look a little bit deeper, you find that they're not. My wife and I, we were off island not too long ago, and we did some shopping, like everybody does when they go off island, right? We bought this bottle of chocolate syrup so the kids can make chocolate milk and I can have it to squirt on my ice cream. Liz had some on her ice cream too. And, and, she, and she said, it's not, I don't feel good after eating this syrup. I wonder, you know, what is it? So I got the bottle. I said, well, let's check the ingredients. You know, the bottle says chocolate flavored syrup. And I'd look on the back and I'm reading the ingredients. And then it has in bold print, but it was really small and it was down on the side. And it said, this product was processed in a facility that may have it may contain anchovies. You're telling me that in my chocolate syrup there might be particles of anchovy in there? Like, ugh. Who, I, I mean, who designed that factory? Well, we're going to have an assembly line that makes chocolate syrup, and right next door we're going to have people cutting anchovies up. And you don't know, some might just fall in the vat. <laughs> False teachings are like that sometimes. On the surface, they look nice. Chocolate flavored syrup. But when you get a little bit deeper, you find it's got anchovies in it. You've got something that doesn't belong in there mixed in that isn't so good. Two specific false teachings are mentioned by Jesus here in Pergamum. The teaching of Balaam and the teaching of the Nicolaitans. The teaching of Balaam taught that to the Gentile Christians that it was okay to ignore two conditions of fellowship that the early church had sent to the Gentiles. Two conditions of fellowship to be in the church was don't eat meat sacrificed to pagan idols and don't engage in sexual sin. But the doctrine of Balaam said it was okay to do those things. So the teaching of Balaam was created a Christianity of compromise, of accommodation, and of concession to the world. And then the teaching of the Nicolaitans, this is a fun one, because the name Nicolaitan is a, made from two Greek words, Nico and Laos. Nico is victory or conquer, and Laos means people. So Nicolaitans literally means to conquer the people, meaning the people in the church, the people of Christ. So if the church is being, if Christians are being conquered, the people who Jesus has set free, then you're being brought back into spiritual slavery and defeat, right? Because in ancient times, when you went in and you conquered a nation, you enslaved that nation. You defeated them, and then you enslaved them. That's what the Romans did all the time. They would go in, conquer a people, and whoever they didn't kill, they would sell as slaves. And then they would come in and colonize that area. Now, if you have a Christianity that, because of false teaching, is a Christianity where Christians are spiritually enslaved again to Satan and are in a state of defeat, then you have a Christianity that is without power, without purpose, and without victory. Amen. And what did Jesus say to this? He said in Revelation 2, 16 through 17, Repent therefore, otherwise I will come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Number three, third word that Jesus gives here is that Jesus is saying to every church everywhere, I will soon come to you. I will soon come to you. Now that's an awesome thing. I mean, every Sunday we want Jesus to come here, right? I will soon come to you. And here he says, I am going to come to, the, your, to your church. I'm going to visit your church. And I'm going to fight for your church. This is what the promise was to Pergamum. 
kind of sounds a little bit like Malachi 3.12, which says, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Remember what happened when Jesus walked into the Jewish temple in the Gospels and found things happening in the temple that did not belong, things that were being tolerated by the priests of the temple? They were supposed to keep the temple as a house of prayer for all nations, but instead they were turning it into a marketplace because they were making a little extra money on the side. And what did Jesus do when he suddenly came to his temple? He turned over the tables and he made a whip of ropes and he drove those people out of the temple. He said, this doesn't belong in the house of God. And sometimes Jesus has to do that in his church. My first real job where you get a real paycheck was working for a department store. And I remember how the store managers would get word that the district manager or the regional vice presidents were making their rounds of the different stores. Uh, There was another store, same chain, about 20 miles away, and they would, their managers would call the managers of the store where I worked at and say, they just left. And the managers would be like, they're gonna be here in half an hour. Everybody would have to run around making everything look really nice. Make sure it's all good. Make sure, you know, instead of just two cash registers open, they had them all open. Everybody had to be smiling to all the customers. Yes, thank you. Nice, have thank you. All the clothes had to be nice on the racks. Get out the dust cloth and clean the dust off the racks. Everything had to be good. In fact, I remember how my very first boss was fired on the spot by the district manager because... That boss was not following procedure and he was months behind in his paperwork. District manager fired him on the spot. They had that much power to make sure that things were being done correctly. Many Christians and many churches all around the world have a high tolerance for false teachings. And it's time for us to really examine what we believe and compare it to what the Bible teaches. Because what we believe as Christians shapes everything that we are as Christians. It affects how you pray. It affects how you read your Bible. It affects how you worship. It affects your faith in God. It affects everything. And many Christians who are desperate for quick answers to their problems have drunk bad water from toxic springs. And that's what happens so often. Oh, it's hard to really pray and to believe God and to wait on God to answer the prayer His way in His time. My wife and I know it's hard to wait on God. And sometimes we don't want to wait on God. We want the quick solution. We want the quick answer. So we latch on to a false doctrine, false teaching. Oh, yes. I'll I'll send $1,000 to that guy on TV. Because he said that if I knelt down in front of my TV and I put my hands on the TV while he prayed, uh, this miracle was going to be released in my life. It's bad water from toxic sources. And then what happens when it doesn't happen the way you wanted it when you want it? Oh, discouragement. Oh, the Bible isn't true now. Christianity is not true. Forget it. I have some relatives who lived in a trailer park in upstate New York. And for a while there, they kept getting sick especially my cousin. Then they learned that other people in the park were all getting sick with the same problem. 
And eventually it was discovered that when the park was built in the early 1960s, they laid the water line and the sewer line side by side in the same trench under the road. And during the winter in upstate New York, it was really cold for a long period of time. The ground froze very deep and the frost broke the water line and the sewer line. And the sewer was contaminating the drinking water and everybody was getting sick from it. Between Christian TV, Christian radio, Christian books and magazines and the internet, there's a lot of teaching out there and not all of it is balanced or biblical. And you know, teaching that is out of balance can be just as dangerous as unbiblical teaching as well. What did John the Baptist come and preach? He preached in Matthew 3, 1 and 2. He said, in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Oh, pastor, that was John the Baptist. He was still kind of an Old Testament prophet. Well, the next chapter in Matthew 4, 17 says from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus was preaching the same thing. When you look at what the apostles preached, they called people to repentance. And what is repentance? Repentance is not a bad thing. Repentance is a good thing, especially when Jesus is coming. Because the ability to repent of a sin or a false teaching when we need to is a sign that you do have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to his church. And remember, repentance is not self-punishment. Repentance is self-correction. Remember that. Jesus is saying to every church everywhere, I know where you live. I have a few things against you. I will soon come to you. So what shall we do? What do we decide? Will we continue to have a high tolerance for the pain of false teaching or not? Will we continue to walk around on a broken foot and only make things worse or not? Will we continue to be content with a Christianity that is without power, without purpose, without victory? Will we continue to drink poisoned water from toxic springs? Or will we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to his church and repent and follow Jesus away from any false teaching that we may have in our minds and in our hearts and be free of it and eat the living bread of the living word of God and drink the living water of the living word of God and be filled with the true spirit of God? Or will we settle for a cheap counterfeit chocolate flavored syrup with anchovies? Let's stand together, church. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> God is so awesome, church. He's got so much for us. So much for all of you. And God has great plans for this place. Great plans for all of you, too. You are all blessed people. Praise the Lord. Blessed because you've got Jesus in your heart. Amen. You've got life in you, true life spiritually. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And I ask if 
Brother Dominic would come and just close the service in a word of prayer. Remember, there's a Gloria's table out there in the foyer, and she'll be out there. And then we also have the teen ministry bake sale going on. Uh, so you've got a lot to get through on your way out of the church, especially all those goodies out there. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Brother Dominic, would you close us in prayer? Father God, again, we just thank you for this opportunity to meet with you and with our brothers and sisters as we can fellowship and learn from your word by your spirit, Lord. And we do thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word, O Lord, that has been faithfully handed down to us, O Lord, the Jewish people and also the prophets and those um, translated it into our, our language, O oh Lord, those that even sacrificed their lives, O oh Lord, that we could read the Bible for ourselves and rightly divide the word, your word of truth, O oh Lord. And so we can study, O oh Lord, and show ourselves approved unto God, O oh Lord. And we thank you, O oh Lord, for the teachers, O oh Lord, that are rightly dividing the word and helping us to understand from your word, O oh Lord, what you require, O oh Lord, and your salvation that is free to us, O oh Lord. And we thank you for our pastor, O oh Lord, that is showing us, O oh Lord, to rightly divide the word, O oh Lord, not to go to the left, to the right, but to follow you, O oh Lord, by your spirit. And as we go from this place, O oh Lord, let us not keep this word to ourselves, even as we've been hearing earlier, O oh Lord, and as we've been taught and praising you, O oh Lord, that this is to be spread through this community, to this island, and to the world, O oh Lord, so that they too, O oh Lord, can know your word, the word that will set them free and learn of your salvation through your Son, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.